please uh, put your hands together for uh, Mr. Hindol Sen Gupta, for uh, Ms. Arundhati Subramaniam, and Mr. Prabdyot Bikram Manikya Dev Barman. That's a heavy name. Uh, I would like to introduce Mr. Barman. Pradyot uh, Bikram Manikya Dev Barman is the current head of the Royal House of Tripura. He is the working president of the Tripura Congress and also the editor-in-chief of the leading magazine news portal TNT, the Northeast Today. A keen musician and a sportsperson in the Northeast and is the director of Ang Ang Anglian Olympic medal hunt, which manages some of the best sports talent in the country. He's also a guest lecturer at the Harvard University. Uh, welcome all of you uh, to the second edition of WIC India Dehradun Community Lip Literature Festival. Uh, let's get the ge session started. Hello, friends. Uh, today we have uh, a very uh, distinguished panel here, a journalist, a poet, and two writers, and in between, an unsuccessful politician. But the idea here is to engage in spirituality, religion, and God. And that's the reason all three of us have descended to Dehradun. And uh, hopefully we will have uh, interesting conversations. And at some point, we would also like the audience to get involved. And uh, if I may request, uh, I know it's slightly warm, but if you all could come slightly further, it would be a lot more nicer if you all could come right in front. Thank you so much. Yeah. But it's just, uh, actually sunny. Yeah. Yep. It's always good to be under the spotlight or the sunlight. So I would request all of you all to come as much as in front. I'll start with the lady here, Arundhati. Uh, She's a poet, and uh, many of you would be knowing about her association with Sadhguru. Uh, I would like to start with uh, your book, which you have done with a biography of Sadhguru. How did that come about? And you've written on uh, Buddha, you've written on Sadhguru, you've written poetries, on mythology, on bhakti poetry. So uh, I would you like to share a, a bit more light on your journey as a writer and as a poet as well. Thank you. Can I be heard? I can't hear myself. I can? Okay. I, I think I should just start by saying, Pradyut, that I, I believed for a good part of my life that most of my answers, the answers to the questions that I had, would come from poetry. Poetry was the, was the place that I was excited about. Poetry was the form that nourished me more than any other. And at the same time, there was a tremendous excitement or interest in philosophy. And I thought somewhere between poetry and philosophy, I would find my answers. I'll come to this question more specifically, but just to talk about where I, how I would locate myself in this discussion, let me say that there came a time in my life, in 97, when it became clear to me that um, these answers would not come from poetry alone, that there were vast areas in myself that I couldn't hope to map in language. It was an experience that I sometimes describe as a near-death experience. I'm not quite sure how to how to talk about it even today. But what I do know is that when I started coming out of it, one thing was clear to me, that the only voices that talked about living and dying in a way that made sense to me at the time were the voices of mystics. They were the only ones, whether it was um, Ramana Maharishi or Ramakrishna or whether it was St. John of the Cross, or Hafiz. It was the voices of mystics that I sought. And that offered consolation, and it offered companionship, and it offered sanctuary. But even that, after a point, was not enough. And that's when a living guide, personally, became important to me. And that's how Sadhguru came into my life. That's my response to this broader question, which I think we need to address before I talk about any of the books, about why I'm here in the first place, talking not about poetry alone, 
but talking about quest. For me, it became clear after my personal 97 experience that I was no longer in my hierarchy of self-definition, poet alone. That far more fundamental than poet was seeker. And that's how I would describe myself even today. Well, that's a very big admittance. I never knew that uh, you realized somewhere down your uh, career path that poetry is not going to give you the, the, all the answers to your queries. And so you seeked beyond that. That's a very personal experience. Now that brings me to Nindol, you know, because uh, we were just having a discussion before we came here. And uh, you told me about your book, Being Hindu, it's sometime in 2014, 15. And uh, that was more, the book is more about your personal journey. Being Hindu is more about your personal journey than actually speaking about the faith itself. Could you uh, elaborate more about this, please? No, I said, I think um, I've been a journalist for about a decade. I've written about seven books. And um, I think most of my work till today has been looking at the world through understanding myself. I think I have realized over time and through my work that the best way I can comprehend the world is by comprehending what's happening to me. If you look at each of the books that I've written, including some of my earlier work, including the liberals and recasting India and so on and so forth, each topic, whether it was understanding India's 20 years of economic liberalization or understanding this dichotomy between socialism and capitalism in India, each of those themes I tried to understand through how my life had changed, how I had gone through those processes, those themes. But after I had written about economics, after I had written about sociology, so to speak, history, and so on and so forth, I arrived at a point where some of the more fundamental questions of my life, I felt, did not have an answer. And at some point, I realized that those answers ought to come to me through what my parents believed were their source of sustenance, which is Hinduism which is their faith or their religion, uh, Hinduism. And, and in Hinduism, the Ramakrishna mission, which is the order which has been followed by my family for many generations now. But I am a Hindu because my parents were, are, are Hindu and my grandparents were Hindu. That was not an answer enough for me. I felt that was an inadequate answer for me to call myself a Hindu. And I wanted to understand why on earth should I A, have a religious identity, B, why should that identity be Hindu? And those answers I wanted to find for myself. And I started to try and find those answers at a point in my life where it occurred to me that many of the things that I had pursued in my life, whether it was fame in my chosen profession, journalism, which was whether it was a particular amount of money, all of those things were not adding up to anything substantial, or at least to put it very simply, weren't making me happy. So I thought I would be happy when I bought my first home, and I thought I would be happy when I bought my first car, and I thought I would be happy when I did this and that and the other, but by the time I was turning 30, I realized that none of those things were adding up to what I understood as happiness. Now, where did that happiness go, was the question. Was it ever there? Was I searching for something that didn't even exist? And my parents seemed to have those answers very easily with their faith, with Hinduism. But I was not so sure, because I was not so sure about what on earth was this thing called Hinduism, right? And I began to try and understand what Hinduism was through, again, the only, only place I can begin and, in fact, the only place I must end, which is myself. And I tried to understand why or what was the relevance of Hinduism in my life and in my work and in my journey. And there began my new phase of writing, which was the book Being Hindu and then the latest book that I've written, The Modern Monk on Swami Vivekananda. Because I came to the conclusion that 
if this thing called Hinduism, indeed if this thing called religion or faith or belief, whatever you want to call it, the search for God, if it is not relevant to me at my day-to-day -day basis, then to me it has no meaning. It has to mean something to me every day. It cannot be something that means something to me five days a, a year when five festivals happen. That did not resonate with me at all. What is Hinduism to me when I wake up cranky in the morning? What is Hinduism to me when I'm, when I'm heartbroken in love? What is Hinduism to me when I have been passed over for a promotion? What is Hinduism to me when I see my mother unwell? What is Hinduism to me, and this is one of my pivotal points, where my father, who I have always seen as an extremely strong, well-built man, progressively year after year become more and more fragile. So the idea of what a father is, was and is disintegrating in front of my own eyes. What is belief then to me? Because I would argue that the idea of my father being literally physically strong represented a belief structure for me. When that belief structure is collapsing and disintegrating in front of my eyes, what does my belief and religion then mean to me? And I started to delve into some of those questions, right? And uh, Arundhati mentioned Ramana Maharishi somebody I, I have been greatly influenced by. So I remember, I come from the Ramakrishna Mission tradition, right? So I spent, I mean, all my childhood years was, I, you know, I, there was Ramakrishna Mission always in my life. Ramakrishna Paramahansa and then Vivekananda. But even that I felt, I had to rediscover. It wasn't enough that I had been told through my childhood that Vivekananda was very good, or very great, or whatever it was that he was. I had to rediscover, and in all of that, I read Paul Brunton's very interesting book called The Search for Secret India, A Search for Secret India. In Secret India. In se Secret India. And he goes to meet Ramana Maharishi, and then I you know, read uh, a lot about Ramana Maharishi. And one of that incidents, and I just want to sort of end my comments, my initial comments with this anecdote, and I found the parallel between these two things. So Paul Brunton writes that he goes to Ramana Maharishi, with a lot of questions. And he's sitting in front of the master and he has all these questions, you know, what will happen to Europe? When will the world, you know, when will the war end? Will there be another war? You know, what will happen to civilization? This, that and the other. Whole range of questions. And he's sitting there waiting with all his questions and then he's asked to ask those questions. Then he asked these questions to, to the master. And Ramana Maharishi, some of you may know, spoke very little, as in he, he, was, he was a fairly, uh, he, he was silent for a very long time. So he turns to Paul Brunton and says, but who's asking this question? And, and Paul Brunton says, what do you mean? Like, you know, of course, I am asking this question and I'm in front of you. You can see me, here I am, right? I mean, I'm a man, I'm sitting in front of you, I'm asking these questions. And the master asks him, but who are you? And I felt a great resonance of that anecdote, that incident, to Vivekananda's great question to Ramakrishna Paramhans, where he has asked Devendranath Tagore, you know, Maharshi Devendranath Tagore of the House of Tagores, have you seen God? And uh, Devendranath Thakur, as the Bengalis would call him, only says, my son, you have the eyes of a rishi, of a yogi. But when he goes to this unlettered village priest, Ramakrishna Paramhans, and asks him, have you seen God? This unlettered, uh, many people told him, crazy village priest tells him, but of course I've seen God, I see him every day. And Vivekananda, who's of course a highly intellectual and bright man says, what do you mean you see him every day? That's crazy, I mean, you don't see God every day. He says, but of course I see God every day exactly the way I now see you. And then he says, but can you show me? And he says, but of course, if you want, I can show you God because I see him every day. And I think that sort of certitude which was missing in my life is really my journey and my trying to understand things. This hunt for a certitude that I believe most people don't have. But some people uniquely have. But what is that certitude? Um, I believe that certitude is God. So, you know, that's, that's in a nutshell the beginning of my journey. Well, that's a 
very interesting. That's more like a personal account being Hindu. Would uh, something like a modern monk be then a natural uh, process because of your uh, influence of uh, Vivekananda and the Ramakrishna mission? Once you were convinced that, uh, because I think being Hindu was a personal journey, uh, the modern monk seems like uh, how you would like to uh, march ahead in your life yeah, on you the see, footsteps of Vivekananda. Yeah, you see, Vivekananda, mm. as often in India, you know, as Indians, you'll realize um, bhakti comes very easily to us, right? Depends from which part of India you're from. No, but everywhere. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm saying this, this idea that something, you know, something or somebody or some idea ought to be worshipped. It's an idea that comes very easily to us, Yeah. right? That has great strengths, but that also has great weaknesses. There are both, at least according to me. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I felt that Vivekananda himself as a man, you know, they say, and this is very interesting, I met this, you know, Buddhist um, preacher, teacher, who told me that the Buddha never wanted Buddhism. And I highly question whether Vivekananda would have identified with what has happened to him today. You know, because Vivekananda is a bit like Ashi Guevara, if you know what I mean. He's everywhere. You know, he's this two-dimensional cutout uh, on our t-shirts and our mugs and our everywhere, right? And he's always in that pose, you know, uh, he's always telling us to arise, awaken and do many things, so to speak, right? Um, that again was inadequate for me. Because I don't think Vivekananda would have wanted to be in the sort of two-dimensional pedestal that we have placed him on. I think Vivekananda is exciting because he's so utterly humane. If you read Vivekananda, here is a man who gets angry frequently. But today that's not what we describe Vivekananda as. You know, he's, he's always this, this figure that is lifted high above and he's telling us glorious sermons from far away. But that's not who he was. He was a man who was pugnacious almost. Right? His letters are extremely... If you read the letters of Vivekananda, he's an extremely pugnacious man. You know, he's, he gets angry, he quarrels with people, he has a point of view, he knows people are not listening to him sometimes, but he, you know, he wants to put forward his point of view. He's very humane, and I think he's exciting because he's such a... He's so rich and so enigmatic as a human being. I think Vivekananda to us is more exciting today as a human being than as a godly figure. And because he's able to rise above being a human being and yet understand many of the deeper philosophies, that is exciting to us. Not as a cardboard cutout as a figure. So I tell my younger audiences often that, you know, Vivekananda did, Vivekananda also understood the final thing about being cool. You know, the ultimate, ultimate way you become cool, which is that you have to die young. If you see anybody who's become cool in the world, you know, all the rock stars, they all died young. I think Vivekananda got that. That you have to be cool, you die young. So, I mean, that's of course a joke, but yeah, to make many of these things really human, I think is, is yeah. Well, uh, <coughs> Buddha lived still quite long, but he's still cool to a lot yeah, of people, yeah? yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that brings me to, he's been speaking about Vivekananda extensively, and uh, that brings me to your, uh, a person who is uh, also considered cool and hasn't died young, <laughs> Sadhguru. Because uh, you've, uh, uh, hopefully, he continues to be with us for many more years and decades. God bless him. And God bless us for having him around us. Uh, but but could Sadhguru is cool, I agree. He's absolutely yeah. very cool. Uh, and very informative and very uh, inspi inspiring as well. And uh, you've written, uh, you, you've told me something which, in a personal conversation, which was the challenges of writing a book on Sadhguru. Because uh, I know you're a poet and we'll come to that in a bit. But yeah, what, are, what were your challenges in writing a book on Sadhguru? And how would you describe that to all of us? I must first say what drew me to Sadhguru. I met Sadhguru in 2004, which was seven years after the experience that I described. When it was clear to me that I was heir to a cultural and spiritual tradition that I was proud of, proud of for various reasons, but which was insufficient. When I say various reasons, I mean that I felt that I was heir to a tradition that allowed me to 
doubt. I was heir to a tradition that allowed me to disagree. I was heir to a tradition that allowed me the right to diversity and to respect diversity. And I was heir to a tradition that allowed me to be an explorer rather than someone who reached for easy conclusions. For me, that was what being Hindu as a lowercase identity meant to me. That's what being a poet as a lowercase identity with a small p meant to me. But when it was clear that the dead mystics were no longer enough, I realized that I needed guidance, but I also realized that I suffered from an affliction that I now term insubordination, which is just my inability to take guidance. My ability, as I say in the book, to turn mentors into tormentors. And so when I met Sadhguru, I felt very drawn, and at the same time, I was apprehensive. What drew me to Sadhguru was not, to go back to what Hindol said earlier, which interested me, it was not as much the fact that he exuded a sense of certainty as much as the fact that he exuded clarity. And I felt that this is a person who would be capable of guiding me on a journey which would not offer easy, pat, feel-good solutions, but who would in fact invite me to a journey and then guide me and be there when I needed it, on a journey that in fact requires a tremendous amount of non-verbal inner work. That is where the journey begins. And that's when I realized that it ends with books and it in fact begins with this inner journey. I met Sadhguru in 2004, but it was in 2006 on a walk that he and I had around the ashram that we started talking about a biography. It excited me because while there were books by Sadhguru, which were largely transcriptions of his talks that were around, I felt that there needed to be a book that mapped his own unimaginably eventful inner life, and I felt it was time to do that. So I agreed with great alacrity, which was rather naive of me at the time, because I realized over the next four years that it was in fact to be a roller coaster journey, that writing about a mystic, a living mystic, is very different from writing, say, a book on the Buddha which is what I had done in 2005. It's wonderful to be writing a book on the Buddha because he's a dead guru. When you have a living guru, it's magnificent because he's there to offer you life and contradiction and argument and insight and illumination, but it's also deeply vexing because he's also there to disagree with you every step of the way. So it was an exhilarating and terrifying journey, and I had many crises of faith along the way. And I think the biggest challenge, Pradyut, would probably be the fact that I didn't know how to tell the story. I was able to have conversations with Sadhguru. I recorded him extensively. But to actually be able to find a way to narrate this extraordinary chronicle was something that I didn't have. And I eventually, I think, realized that a book was taking shape when I found that I'd, I had a tone. And it was a tone that allowed for wonder. It was also a tone that allowed for inquiry. It was a tone of respect, but it was also a tone that allowed for questions. And to me, this was the balance that I was constantly seeking, but which was not something that I found easily. And then I realized I am incapable, really, of writing a hagiography. Even if I want to, I cannot write a weak-kneed narrative of blind adoration. But I am also incapable of writing an expose. I do not approach Sadhguru with cynicism. I never have. I've approached him with doubt, but I have never approached him with suspicion. And that mix of wonder 
and respect. I think when I felt that that balance had been achieved, that's when I thought perhaps a book is on its way. But then it was also accelerated by an email that I received from Sadhguru in 2009, which said, is this going to be a posthumous biography? And that's when I realized I had to sit down and finish the wretched thing. And it eventually happened in 2010. So uh, generally, a shishya and a biographer, that could be your story, because you're a shishya and you are his biographer as well. Uh, this is a question which is uh, to both of you all. The, the subject of discussion here uh, is God and me. And I see a lot of uh, students here in front of us. What is the relationship between God and you? Is it spiritual? Is it, a, is it, is it to do with sermons of uh, uh, people who have served the, uh, uh, of godly people? Or is it like we come from the Northeast? It's very spiritual, it's very animistic. We see God in a tree, we see God in fire. So it's very animistic. So what is your relationship between God and you? And how would you define that to uh, the students? Because there's a larger narrative that you need to identify with God. Now, who, what is God to you? What is God to you? Can you, cl can you answer that? Pehle aap. So I think this is one question which... Um, I mean, this was one of the most interesting things that I, in a sense, concluded when I finished writing Being Hindu. Until date... I'm a Hindu because of the answer to this question. Let's put it that way. Uh, if the answer to this question were any different, then I perhaps would not be a Hindu. So the answer to this question, according to me, which keeps me a Hindu, so to speak, is the idea that there is divinity or God is nowhere to be found where you are not found. Or to change the direction of, of inquiry, there is no God but that which lies inside you. And therefore, any manifestation that you consider divine is equally relevant. Which means, to me, if today Pradyut were to say he sees God in this microphone as a singer, it would be perfectly not only acceptable but almost obvious to me. It would be obvious to me that as a singer, uh, he would see divinity in an instrument of his musical journey. It would not be unusual to me at all. If Arundhati were to say that she sees God in a pen or indeed in the cup and saucer in front of her, perhaps as a coffee enthusiast, it would not surprise me at all. Because any enthusiasm taken to the most pure form, to me, is nothing but the search for the divine. Because at the end of the day, it's search for meaning. So an enthusiasm, and then the, you know, the mystics, the masters have always taught that, that's why you can find God in dance, for instance. I mean, that is, in an artist, that's always been true. The Sufi masters taught the same thing in music. I mean, uh, I, I still remember, and it's a, it's a moment I've never forgotten. I was watching Abida Parveen sing once in Jahane Khusro, and she, was, she started to sing, and at some point, she began to look, she ignored the audience entirely and began to sing with her head tilted upwards. And it really occurred to me, even though she did not say this, that she really didn't care about the audience or that stage or that monument behind her at all. She was singing directly to her idea of the divine. Whatever her idea of the divine was, it was a direct conversation via her music to the idea of her divine. And this answer of Hinduism that because the idea of God or God indeed is within you, any manifestation of that you see, whether as he said, in a tree or a bird or anything, anything, you, you, you name a thing, is equally relevant, is one of the most interesting answers and I would say the defining answer to why I am a Hindu. Because it allows me not only a natural sense of plurality and I believe plurality is the natural order of things because you see plurality in nature, it's see, you see it all, nature is not homogeneous. There isn't one kind of tree or one kind of bird or one kind of animal and so on and so forth, right? Nature is naturally heterogeneous. 
So plurality is natural in, in you know, all around us. And this answer is naturally allows us this plurality. And it allows the other thing that Arundhati was talking about, an infinite scope for questioning and doubt. Because what would a conversation with God be if it isn't about questions? Right? I mean, if you, f if you found God, you would ask questions. That's the most natural thing. So because it allows these two things, I'm a Hindu. Otherwise, perhaps I wouldn't be one. Arundhati, what's your relationship with God? Because this entire thing is about God and me. Let me approach that uh, from the point of view and just touch initially on the book of Bhakti poetry that I edited recently. It's called Eating God. And as the very title suggests, it's about an absolutely unconventional, into inverted commas, irreverent approach to God. And I think what drew me to the Bhakti poets from the very start is the fact that the God that they invoke is the kind of God I would like to know. I don't know whether he or she exists. This I must say at the start. But it's the kind of God I would like to have a conversation with. This is the kind of God who can be infinite and intimate at the same time. This is the kind of God who can be divine and domestic at the same time. This is the part that they talk about is one that can be popular, it can be profane, it can be participatory, and it can still be a pilgrimage. And above all, I think I'm drawn to these poets because they tell us that to ask for personal answers to ultimate questions is our birthright as human beings. And with that, I'd say that I am drawn to this conception of the divine, but do I think it is absolutely necessary to hold on to it on this quest? I'd say no. I'd say that what excites me about this particular spiritual culture that I'm a beneficiary of is two things. One, that it allows me to use every aspect of myself or what I consider to be myself today, which is my body, my mind, my heart, the actions that I perform in the ex external world, my energy, the energy that empowers me and fuels me. It empowers me to use all of that on my journey of self-understanding. None of it is excluded. I am not told for a minute that this body is impure and therefore cannot be part of this journey. I am not told for a minute that this heart in some way is inferior and imbecilic and therefore cannot be a part of this journey. I am not told that I must give up the mind and that only if I give up the mind I can be part of this journey. I am in fact told that the only journey that makes sense is one that integrates all of this. And to me, that is empowering, deeply empowering. The fact that I'm not asked to deny any part of myself, that I'm not asked to amputate any part of myself. And the second thing that I'd say, and I'll conclude with that, the second thing that I find exciting about this assortment of wisdom traditions that we have in this country, in this subcontinent, is the fact that it allows you 330-odd million-odd gods and goddesses to choose from. You can choose one that's most suited to your taste and your temperament. And if you don't like any of them, you can invent one. And if you don't want to invent one and you want to chuck the whole pantheon out of the window, you can still continue with your spiritual journey. To me, that is truly empowering. The fact that the ideal here is not God, that is empowering. The ideal is liberation. For me, that perhaps is one of the most fundamental facts that drew me to this journey. That's, uh, that's very heartening to hear, actually. As a person uh, who's sandwiched between uh, two people who seem to have a certain amount of authority on faith and spirituality, uh, I believe that uh, the day you are asked not to choose 
who you prefer over someone is the day you actually choose. And religion, faith or God should never be thrust upon us, but should come naturally. Uh, we come from the Northeast and uh, we don't see God at, in a tree, but we see tree as a creation of God, hence we don't chop it down. We see uh, nature and we worship that because it's a creation of God. Not to destroy is also to follow the diktats of the God or the sermons of the God. Last question before I throw it open to all of uh, you all uh, in the audience. We have 15 minutes uh, of uh, interaction with the audience. Is Would there be one final thing that you would like to do as a poet or as a writer when you come back again here next time? Because we've had wonderful hosts. Uh, she's been lovely as a host and we, we see her in the audience. Would you like to uh, add on something uh, as individuals or as writers or as poets which you would like to do in the forthcoming year which would uh, be a which would be self-satisfying as well as an addition when we come back here again in few years of time Hengol has you to know, go when first. you said come back again I almost thought you know in, a, in another lifetime you yes. know and I'm back here in another lifetime, you know. And, and he I is supposed to be an optimist who listens I, to Vivekananda. I, am, I, am, I don't think my mukti is happening in this lifetime. So, you know, when I'm back again here in, yeah. I mean, who knows, you know, if I'm born again and there might be another festival here. I don't know whether Nazia would be hosting it at that time, but we don't know. We'll, we'll find out. Yeah, who knows. No, I mean, jokes apart. Um, well, I mean, this is not the first time Nazia has played host to yeah, me. I so I have been, I've been grateful to receive her hospitality even before that, and thank you very much. Uh, she's always an extremely gracious and, and most generous host. No, I think, um, I think I want to go back to something Nazia and me and some other people are already doing, which is, which is to have, in, in a sense, the sort of conversation we've had here today, uh, which is to have more open and lucid conversations about religion in India uh, and faith and spirituality and, and the and the search for God. Look, I, I mean, just to, my final remarks are this, which is what I'm really looking at these days and, and, the, and the topic of my research today. We are approaching an age, as, as many of us, or many of you already know, where the, what it means to be human might change dramatically in our lifetime. And if technology and science moves the way it already is, Actually, maybe in the next five or ten years, what it means to be human, as we understand it, might entirely transform. I am just coming, I, I just returned from Argentina, I was just telling them, uh, and I was telling Nazia, I just saw th this company in California, which has built uh, a technology, and this is clear, uh, completely out of science fiction, where using a particular headset, you're able to move things around just by thinking about that. And not only that, I saw with my own eyes, a Formula One car, which was driven by a paraplegic who couldn't, can't even use his hands, only by wearing a headset and thinking about the fact that the car should drive around a racing track. Now, five years ago or even two years ago, this would be straight out of a science fiction movie. But this is possible and absolutely possible that this technology exists today. So what will happen to us as human beings is changing very fast. You know, I mean, interestingly, uh, Arundhati is here. I was just with, I was presenting my book to Sadhguru uh, just about a month ago and I asked him that they're saying that they can change, they can reverse aging, that man might never die, they will, you know, stop the process of death. So what does that, all of that mean to, me, uh, to us, you know, as human beings? So he laughed at me and said, you're already overweight, you come stay at my ashram for a few days, I will reverse your aging. So, uh, so I mean, that's of course funny, but, but it was very interesting, I think. Um, we will go through in our lifetimes, I believe, one of the greatest transformations of what it means to be human than the world has ever seen. Because that technology that was outside us will go inside us, into our very bodies and minds. At that point, one of the most important things would be to know yourself. Because if you don't know yourself, that technology can take you into directions that you've never imagined. And I think this knowing yourself is the fundamental pillar of our existence anyway. But that will become even more important going into the future. And I think while the West will give us all the ideas of 
<coughs> you know, oil, you know, throw away fossil fuels, have a battery in your home that can give you energy for the rest of your life and, and that sort of leaps of faith and imagination in technology. I think it is the East which will give us the answers to the turmoil some of this technology will cause to us and our notion of being human. And never before perhaps has, been, has it been more important for us to understand our very nature, our very selves, in order to really engage fruitfully with the future that is already upon us. So next time we are here, perhaps technology would have taken another leap of faith and perhaps there would be an opportunity to discuss some of these things. Very well put. In fact, I completely agree with you. I hopefully would have you on the t-shirt of being human than Salman Khan. <laughs> uh, why don't you tell me about, uh, because what it holds, because I do know that you've written, uh, you did mention uh, something that you, it's a half a book or something that you're, uh, which is on the shelf, which you would like to come back with. All right, so you're linking it to the same question. Absolutely. Okay. But uh, I, I thought of those as two separate ones, actually. Um, the book that he's alluding to is a book that's just out. It's a book called Adi Yogi, The Source of Yoga, which is a book that I co-authored just a month ago with Sadhguru, and it's out. It's published by HarperCollins. Would I like to come back to this festival with that book? I'm not? not so sure. But I let me say this. I'm, that's not really what I was thinking as much as... I would like to come back and read poems to you. That's what I'd like to do. For me, poetry is a way, and maybe I'd like to read some bhakti poems to you, because poetry is a way of talking about knowing and not knowing all at once. And it's a way of being unapologetic about that. It's a way of saying it's absolutely all right not to know. It's absolutely all right to be joyfully perplexed. That sense of wonder is what I'd like to share with you. And that to me happens when I read a poem aloud. That's what I'd like to share. Thank you both very much. Uh, lovely and a very, uh, uh, a, a, a discussion which has informed not only all of us in the audience, but me within as well. I think uh, this has been a very uh, gratifying uh, conversation. And, uh, I would like the audience to, I know there are a few in the audience who have already uh, uh, asked that they would like to ask a few questions. So uh, we have two or three questions, if you could just ask them, if you could pass the mic around. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit because there's so many young people here. Uh, many, many years ago, I, at the Madhuvan, I heard Swami Ram uh, lecture. And after the lecture, uh, a very senior bureaucrat said, um, sometimes I feel guilty because I don't have time to do puja. I don't have time to do worship. So he looked at him and he said, look, if you every morning do your duty towards your family, your work, your fellow beings and the environment, you've done your puja. You don't need more than that. So I want to tell all the young people that if you do your homework well, you listen to the teachers, you are nice to your friends, you worship. And that's very, very important to know. Because so far we've talked about God, but worship is something I know most of you are wondering about. And another thing which I feel which should be addressed is that there's too much of uh, ritualism in religion today that we are forgetting the spiritual aspect. And that is what uh, you, you talked about, about the divinity within. In the Northeast, we do believe, yes, that inside all of us, there's the divine and the profane. And it depends what you tap, what you cherish, what you nurture, that de determines you as a human being. So it's not at all difficult to be religious or to be godly or to be good. You just have to be yourself. You just have to do, you just have to think good, speak good, and do good. That's all you have to do. Thank you. So can I take a contrarian position to one of the things you said? Yes. Um, because I agree, I mean, you know, God is divine, you know, the divinity is within, I mean, you know, I completely agree with that. I, of course, spoke about that. 
But let's come to this ritualism business, right? Yes. I oh. spent many years of my life looking down on ritualism, saying, oh, no, what is I this, you know? I rituals no, and can I, can I, Can I just, yeah, yeah can sure, I just sure, make a point? Sure, yeah. sure. While I agree that senseless, thoughtless rituals do more harm than good, Swami Vivekananda famously spoke about this and wrote about this. Yes. But I also think in India, it is also fashionable at a level to look down on religious, and on, on religious rituals. It depends, ritualism, it depends on how you're doing that ritual. Exactly. Do you know what that ritual means? If you're saying the Gayatri Mantra every day, yes. do you know why the Gayatri Mantra is wonderful? Is if you powerful? do know, yes, yes. there is no harm in rituals. But I also think because, you know, we are anglicized and we speak English in a particular way, yes. it's very convenient and easy to look down on, you know, the masses who do rituals. Whereas us cool people who are like, you know, a little too hip for rituals and therefore, oh, we are so spiritual. I think that is condescension. Yes, I spent I, many years yeah. being like that. But I realized with time, often people who don't speak English like me really understand the traditional value of certain rituals are actually perhaps far closer to God than I will ever be. Or perhaps understand the divinity within, even though they cannot articulate it in the way that I can in the English language, they understand it more deeply than I ever can. So there are two ways of looking at it. So that's number one. Number two, since we're on the topic of Gayatri Mantra, I mean, it's a fantastic mantra because it never asks for things that most prayers ask for, which is benevolence and protection and so on and so forth. It asks for intelligence. But I don't think we teach our children these things at all. We teach them to become, you know, and this yes, whole thing about I'm yes. spiritual, not religious, I don't even see the difference between the two things. Either you're a seeker or you're not. So whether you're religious or spiritual, as long as you're doing the rituals, with understanding, there with is no problem. understanding, and that must be taught in the schools and at home. It has to begin at home. If you understand what you are doing, then you, you've got it. I say the Gayatri Mantra every day because I understand what it is. But if you can't, what I'm saying is what you can't, don't feel bad about it like the bureaucrat. Yeah. Just be good. And you, that's the path towards godliness. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? There's a gentleman there, yeah. Hi, uh, I have a question for you since you travel the whole world. Uh, question regarding articulation. I'll just give a one minute example of myself. My father was a karma yogi throughout his life. He lived like a karma yogi. I, he loves me, but he could not even utter those two words to me in his whole life. For him, religion was just pray in front of God, do puja for one hour. And only when I myself read Swami Vivekananda for the first time, I realized he's a karma yogi. So in India, we kind of are so much into being that we are not into articulation at all. And if I go to this anywhere in the world and I go to any church or anywhere and they are so much into talking and not actually being what they are. So how do you solve this articulation? Like why we just don't articulate at all? Yeah, religion? this is a very good so question order, actually. Uh, order. Uh, well, both of you all yeah, can yeah, answer this. Yeah. Actually, why don't you? Why yeah, it's not a question uh, to me. No. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, at the first basic level, Karan Johar made a full film about this. You know that, right? It's called Kabhi Khushi Kabhi Gam. Kyu nahi hum keh paate that you know you love your parents. You know, so that being that it is, the, being uh, what that film was, it was an interesting film. You should say it. It's all about articulation. But um, but look, I don't think we are this or that, right? I mean, yes, your father may have not had uh, uh, the inclination to articulate certain things, but at a certain level. Indians are all about articulation. In fact, when I travel in the West, I feel the West, they don't articulate enough. Indian parents tend to be, you know, a little too exuberant many a times. So actually in India, we have everything. So you have one experience. I might have a different experience. Somebody else has a different experience. I think where the articulation challenge lies is in explaining some of our, and I, I really liked what Arundhati said, that she felt at some point that she's an heir to a particular tradition. I think that's what I miss in my schooling. I was never, it was never explained to me that I was an heir to a particular philosophical tradition at all. I think that articulation is missing. If we're able to teach our children and future generations, your children and others, that there is a particular, you know, generations before us and our ancestors did think about some really interesting things and we are an heir to that tradition, 
that is the articulation I think is missing, which I mean, I blame my education, but that's a different conversation. Now, I don't want to go there, but that is the missing link. And I think it is finally getting sorted by the work of many gr writers, uh, Arundhati's work, many others, you know, there is an attempt to solve some of that, uh, that articulation problem. And hopefully some of that will get solved. Arundhati, would you like to add on to this? I would just say, at the risk of reiterating what I said before, I think what I understood as most empowering about yoga as a system is the fact that it allows you every aspect of yourself. It does not deny any aspect of yourself. The fact that you can be all of these, you may be a little more of one than another. You may be a little more of a karma yogi than a bhakti yogi. But no one, not a single human being, is just one thing or the other. That every human being is a very idiosyncratic cocktail of bhakti, karma, jnana, kriya, karma, all of this. Hatha yoga is a wonderful way of just using the body to understand yourself. The fact that all of this comprises who we are and that you find a way in which you can, or hopefully your spiritual guide helps you find a way, to make, find a cocktail that suits you. That's all that really the path is about. So for me, what has been particularly important is the path. Less about, it's really been less about God and more about the path. And I think that's what we've been talking about today. So I'd say, I mean, yes, of course, as Hendol pointed out, there's a personal experience that you might have. But even to be fair to your father, we would have to acknowledge that he was a mix of many, many possibilities. Some of them perhaps relatively unexpressed. And the other thing I'd say to just to respond, and this is entirely in jest, but maybe not entirely. What was said earlier about do your homework, since there are so many school, uh, school girls and boys around, let me just say, and I'm just, this is just a statement I'm putting out there, that if you were to pick up the book on Sadhguru, you'd find that he was one young boy who never did his homework. So I don't know if that's inspiring or whether you shouldn't actually be reading that book. It's perhaps a very dangerous book for you to read. But uh, I think, going back to what I'm heir to, I'm heir to a tradition that allows me to seek. I'm heir to a tradition that allows me question marks. That's what being a student is about. Having lots of space for question marks, having lots of space for hyphens, lots of space for dashes, and less space for full stops. I say this really, very, this is a heartfelt invitation to younger people because I wish I had been invited to do the same thing. The, the full stop is an element of punctuation that is very beguiling. The world will encourage you to believe that you have arrived because you sound like you have answers. But in fact, it takes a certain amount of courage to set aside the the full stops, particularly the inherited full stops, and start asking questions and start making room for question marks. So I just want to add one thing here, which is in my book on Vivekananda also. You should look at that book. You should, one of the things I dug out for my book on Vivekananda was the marks he got in high school. I urge you to take a look at the marks Vivekananda scored in high school. They are not very impressive to say the least. You know, because I mean, he was just somebody who, uh, as, as brilliant as he was, and with a photographic memory and this, that, and the other, I don't think he was very interested in studies as, as was understood in his school. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, was, uh, very, uh, I was very excited to see his, uh, his mark sheets. You know, they delighted me, truly. And I think uh, many students, if you were to look at Vivekananda's mark sheets, it would delight you too. You know, if he made it, there's hope for all of us, you know? Well, there's definitely hope for me. I just wanted to put on a point to what you said. It's a very um, important question that you asked on uh, expression. You see, uh, not every answer can be found in faith or religion. It's also individuals and personalities and also societal. Uh, in India, largely, the job of a mother is to love the lalla. We can see that in even politics. But... The fact can is, you say that again? I can say that in politics. Uh, 
our prime minister loves his mother and vice versa yeah but my point is that the role of a man in the family has always been the head of the family and not to show too much of emotion and that has been largely prevalent in the generation or a couple of generations before us in my generation as well i think that is slowly changing but that is not something to do with india i see lot of societies in the west which are christian which are equally as less expressive and some societies which are also christian or muslim and they are more ex expressive it's more to do with geography and society and the patriarchal role of a family i think that is a larger point and not everything can be linked with uh, faith i do believe that we need to express more as men women to our children as parents as brothers and sisters but i think there are certain dimensions outside the parameters of religion it is just one to one human relationship uh, any other question uh, this is we have just we'll combine the questions together because we are pressed for time there's another panel discussion happening yeah uh, hi i am dipti sahgal and i am a doctor into holistic sciences so i've just uh, started delving into this holistic sciences field and so i could relate a lot to what the two authors just mentioned there is a question in there for long and i guess this is the right platform to ask so um, so there's a lot of wisdom in our culture we've already you know you've talked a lot about it how and why it happened that today we are totally disconnected with this wisdom and why is it that only a few set of people are only kind of you know getting into it and passing on that knowledge through books or any other mediums but largely this this understanding is totally missing that's my first question the second is as parents and teachers on daily basis how we can kind of uh, sorry how we can kind of inculcate that wisdom in our children in a very understandable way so that over time they kind of start imbibing these uh, these things in their personality uh, somebody you. else we can combine the question there's one more question i think is a gentleman there this is the last question the gentleman there yeah thank you uh, my name is kushal rana i am from dehradun and if you will excuse me i have a knee problem so no 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 problem absolutely okay. fine okay uh, now what i want to uh, uh, talk about is something uh, beyond earth since uh, when we talk about religion uh, not necessarily hinduism it can be any religion we always look up to the heavens and uh, maybe that's natural that uh, you know the connection that we have with our the origins of our gods might be the answer there so um you know uh, there's a lot of perceptions from the west especially uh you know when they talk beyond jesus they come back to uh, refer a lot to hinduism and they when they say okay uh, there's a originator who uh, have been sending prophets to our world in different forms in different religious garbs so i would like to have uh, both of you uh, hindu as well as arun this short answer as to are we uh, heading for a meeting with our makers uh, in the new future or maybe a thousand years later um, you know when i was young um our father and grandfather never talked about aliens and people coming from you know uh, other planets but uh, increasingly we have been hearing you know there are forces out there who are trying to connect us now especially uh, in a, in the uh, the uh, you know the um, stormy period that we are you know mankind is going through and uh, you know and they're trying to make a last bid move that uh, you know mankind you know uh, doesn't you know doom itself so can i have a take uh, from each of you no so just to uh, take the questions for the lady asked i mean why is it uh, that a lot of our i mean not just new generations but why is a lot of knowledge of our ancient traditions not present or understood by um, by a large number of indians well that's because we spend most of our independent history looking down on these traditions 
right? I mean, uh, today to understand that the Pythagoras theorem ought to be called Bodhayana's theorem, who do we turn to? The American Fields Medal winner, David Mumford. But why does it have to be David Mumford? Why does it have to be an American mathematician who's won a medal which is known as the Nobel Prize for Mathematics? And that's why we accept what he's saying is true, but doesn't come from an Indian. Because modern India or independent India was taught to believe that most of our ancient knowledge was trash. Right? I mean, unfortunately, that's true. And that's, where, that's what has brought us to this state. Right? Um, and, and that's why also it's so easy for some people to go and say, oh, but you know, maybe we had aeroplanes 5,000. Of course, we didn't have aeroplanes 5,000 years ago. But we should really understand what we had 5,000 years ago. Because nobody understands what we had 5,000 years ago, it's so easy for some people to be snooty about it and for others to claim that we had aeroplanes 5,000 years ago. You see what I mean? Obviously, when you don't know anything about something, both extremes become true, right? So we should spend some time to understand what really did we have and why was it exciting if it was exciting at all? And what can we do about it? Well, look, I mean, it's all very well that we should teach uh, future generations, but the present generation itself doesn't know anything. I mean, I don't think I know much, to be honest. I've just begun the process of getting to know. So we ourselves, what will we teach our children? We ourselves don't know anything. I mean, Indians are a particularly deracinated, you know, I mean, we're a particularly, that's why I think, you know, uh, so-called poorer people, you know, it's fashionable in Indian cities to say, oh, these village people, a lot of the wisdom that's there in our villages and small towns actually is far more authentic and legitimate than the pseudoness that we see in our cities. I mean, that's the honest truth, right? And as far as Sir's question is concerned, aliens, Sir, if you come to Delhi, I'll show you lots of aliens. They exist today. We don't have to go far away. Uh, you come to Delhi with me, I'll show you. There are a lot of aliens all around. Uh, and trouble times, I mean, trouble times, actually, statistically, in, uh, human beings are going through the most peaceful time ever in history. So you should read Bill Gates on this. There are, it's, it's statistically proven. We are, human beings have never been wealthier, more prosperous, have a longer life than ever before. So you, I, should, I recommend that you read this Swedish economist called Johan Norberg, who's written a full book about this called prosperity, right? So, um, and uh, what can we do in these troubled times when we might n meet aliens? Well, welcome it and embrace it. I would like to see a few aliens. You know, I mean, I keep wanting to see ghosts. I haven't seen one yet. So if the aliens come, great. Maybe they're going to change. I mean, if the aliens can come and sort out the air pollution in Delhi, I would be delighted. You know, all the rampant construction in Uttarakhand, you know? I mean, you come to Dehradun, you look, look at Dehradun 20 years ago and look at Dehradun today, right? I mean, if the aliens can stop it, I would be delighted. I can't hear you. Wait for the microphone. Sorry, what? No, I, 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 was, I was talking more about, a, a, you know, a deeper thing yeah. for the whole mankind. Like, you know, uh, a spark that is just, uh, you know, about to you know, uh, inflame the world. You know, really? We, Do you think we, there's we, a spark about to inflame the world? We, that, that's, that's what I understand. I and don't that's, think that's true. Uh, I think that's a theory. That's a theory. So, uh, I just wanted to know your take since, uh, you know, we're talking about God and me. So, so I think, I mean, I, I mentioned this before, right? On a serious note, understanding yourself is the only answer, according to me at least. The only thing you can do is understand yourself better. There's no other answer anywhere to be found. And, and on a lighter note, if a spark is going to blow us all up, I welcome it. I think I've done my bit. So if I go in a spark now, I'm good. You know, I, I, here I am chilling in Dehradun. Now if I die, I'm good, you know. Okay. Can I have uh, Arun that is... Uh, uh, I would actually, the, the, for me, the immediate response to your question is a book on Adi Yogi that I just mentioned, which I would actually suggest that you pick up for the simple reason that it talks about many of the questions that you have raised, but I don't think it offers you one single answer. That to me is what made writing that book with Sadhguru such a pleasure. The entire last section of the book is about conversations with Sadhguru that I had on a journey to Mount Kailash and back. And in fact, some of these questions are the ones that 
we talked about. And I'm not going to say more at this point other than this, that whether we think of it as from elsewhere or here, for me, one of the aspects of that Adi Yogi book that was exciting was in fact reminding myself of Adi Yogi as Bhuteshwara. Not in fact from outside, not in fact from up there, you talked about looking heavenward, but very much someone who understood the play of the five elements very much about earth as much as about sky, as much about water and fire and all this this entire mysterious recipe that makes us human, which we haven't even begun to address. So before we start addressing the mysteries of alien life, if we really started looking at the mystery of being human, I think we would be onto a particularly fascinating journey. Thank you. I think uh, with this, I would like to conclude just last remarks to what he said is that uh, aliens to hamare beech mein bhi kafi hain kyunki agar hum apne ek dusre ko bardasht nahi karenge ek dusre ko pyar nahi denge ek dusre ke sang nahi jiyenge to bahar se kaun barbaad karega hame hum apne aap hi ko barbaad kar denge we are all children of god yeah. and with this i think uh, this is a lovely conversation on uh, spirituality god and me and uh, i would like to thank the audience for uh, having uh, both the authors and me here it was a lovely interaction session and I am very glad that we leave this place Thank you. wiser and hopefully with a bit more positive uh, outlook to our life than what we were when we came onto the stage. Thank you very much. And uh, would you like to say anything? Nothing? No. Nothing? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for your uh, thought-provoking session. I'd like to call upon uh, Ms. Mukta Kandelwal Vice President for WIC to please facilitate, uh, felicitate, I'm sorry, uh, all of you. And uh, Mukta. Thank you so much, Mr. Barman. Thank you so much, Mr. Hindal Sen Gupta. Thank you so much, ma'am.